Our third and final panel of the day is our keynote conversation on reproductive justice after Dobbs. In the aftermath of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization's Supreme Court decision last summer, one of the most pressing and divisive issues relating to religion and women's rights today is reproductive justice and access to abortion as we already started touching on in our last conversation. While most observers tend to associate religious faith with arguments against abortion, clergy and faith-based activists have also fought to increase access to reproductive care from assisting women in their search for abortions in the years preceding Roe versus Wade to spearheading challenges in our post-Dobbs legal landscape. This conversation will discuss the past, present, and future of the role of faith in the movement for reproductive justice. This movement uh, around access to abortion specifically and larger issues of reprodu reproductive justice framed so brilliantly by black women activists is multitudinous and wide ranging. And our participants here on stage represent different organizations and different faith traditions. But it's important that we emphasize that we are only scratching the surface of this dynamic movement. And we hope that this conversation is going to spark further and more wide ranging debates as well. Now to introduce today's panelists. Letitia James, affectionately known as Reverend Pleasure, is a black queer femme womanist writer, facilitator of healing spaces and sacral spirituality coach, a master of divinity and certificate of sexuality and religion graduate from the Pacific School of Religion. She lives and works at the intersection of pleasure activism, sacral sanctity, spirituality, reproductive and healing justice. Andrea Coppell began her career at Planned Parenthood Federation of America and has spent the last 25 years working to improve the lives of women and families in New York's nonprofit sector. She's currently the executive director of the National Council of Jewish Women of New York. Katie Zay is the chief executive officer of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. She's an ordained Baptist minister and member of the Clergy Advocacy Board of Planned Parenthood. And they're joined by our moderator, Erin Carmone, who holds the distinction of having moderated a panel at every one of our MAX conferences since its inception. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. <laughs> she is a senior correspondent at New York Magazine, a CNN contributor, and co-author of the best-selling Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which inspired a traveling exhibition that we hosted here to critical success in 2021. She's a national reporter at MSNBC and NBC News, as well as a staff writer at Salon and Jezebel, covering gender reproductive rights in the law. As a contributing writer to the Washington Post's Outlook section, she won a 2018 Mirror Award from the Newhouse School at Syracuse University for her work breaking the story of sexual harassment allegations against Charlie Rose. Please welcoming me and please join me in welcoming them all here today. Thank you so much, Anna, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a thrill to be with you in person. Uh, it's a thrill to be, I guess, I don't know if anybody else has done what I have gotten to do, but every convening, whether it's virtual or in person, um, in which we contemplate history that was written out of the mainstream narrative uh, is a real privilege. So thank you all of you for coming, and thank you so much to these brilliant panelists. I'm really looking forward to challenging assumptions that we make about reproduction, pleasure. I love that that word is already in the mix here. Um, faith, spirituality, history. Um, so we're gonna try to do that in an hour. Cool. Um, I, I have faith, um, I guess RBG used to say uh, to her clerks, get it right and keep it tight. And so we're gonna try to do that. Um, I want to start out by opening up the floor to my brilliant panelists. Leticia, I'm going to ask you to start to situate um, the work that you are doing and the tradition from which you come. And especially because this title, Reproductive Justice, is suggestive of something so much bigger, I'd love to start with you to just break it all down about where it comes from, what it means. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good, after good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. 
So reproductive justice is a framework that was developed by black women and also by women of color in response essentially to the fact that the reproductive rights movement was leaving out the lives of black women and brown women and poor women and disabled women and other birthing people. And so the original tenet foundation, tenets of reproductive justice say you have the right to have children, you have the right to not have children, you have the right to raise any children you have in healthy and safe environments. Since that time, with second wave and now third wave reproductive justice, we are also naming explicitly within that the right to bodily autonomy and body sovereignty. Why that's important and why it's important to name that it was created by black women and women of color, especially in response to the ways that mainstream feminism were leaving them out of the conversation and leaving them out of the fight for reproductive rights is because that is also a project of colonialism. And so when we're talking about the ways that faith has always been a part of this conversation and that um, white Christian nationalists, not only do they not own the conversation, they did not start it. It is because, as Kelly Brown Douglas uh, talks about, that embodied bodies, also known as blues bodies, are a threat to the status quo. They are a threat to empire because we take with us all of the things that make us human, right? We take with us the blood and the pain and the pleasure. We do not separate sexuality from spirituality. So when you think about pre-colonization, when you're th thinking about African ancestral practices and traditions, there was no separation of sexuality and spirituality. Everything was in one. It was an embodiment. There was an understanding that if a uh, woman's life was in danger because of a pregnancy, you were going to do what needed to be done to preserve life, in that case, her life. That if we were in a situation where um, for example, you had the rape of someone in the village, that became a village project in terms of healing. That became a way of looking at and grounding how is it that we are going to move forward um, together as a community. It was not until colonization that all of these things started to be siloed um, into different sectors, into different ways of being. Um, all of that is new in the grand scheme of life, uh, that, that separation, um, and it very much has to be, it is tied to colonization and currently is tied to white national Christian supremacy, the way that it's being expressed um, in these onslaught of laws that are trying to be passed. I, I wanna ask a follow-up because I, I, I'm so intrigued by your professional description and how you, so drawing on the tradition that you just described, could you take us through your work a little bit? Sure. So um, I'm a Pentecostal girl. <laughs> I, was, I was raised in the black church. I am a child of the black church. Uh, however, and like um, Melva Sampson talks about, um, the black church came out of African tradition as well. So something that I have always loved is the way that we practice drums the way that drumming is how we speak to one another and is also this form of um, embodiment. So in the church that I grew up in, there was never going to be a Sunday that we did not dance. Um, if there was a service and there was no dancing, something was wrong. <laughs> there would be a lot of confusion. Um, and so that is the tradition that I come from and that I grew up in. And so when we're talking about the different, um, the plurality of Christianity that got talked about in the previous panel, um, right, there is a particular type of Christianity that is taking up space on the main stage. Um, and so I also had to contend, unfortunately, though, within my tradition, Pentecostal tradition, it is still a conservative tradition. And so as a queer person, having to reconcile my own faith, having to reconcile what it meant um, to be a blues body, as Kelly Brown Douglas puts it, and in that unlearning and relearning, it led me to seminary. Uh, I was actually working at an HIV AIDS organization for women and girls of color. 
and I was the youth program manager, I continuously encountered young women of color who were engaging in risky behaviors because of the messaging they had gotten from their churches. So things like, oh, if you weren't a virgin, then you were unworthy. Things like, if you were queer, then you were worthless. And so they were purposely putting themselves in harm's way because they had internalized that self-hate, right? And so then they thought that they did not deserve, they were not worthy of being loved, of being seen as whole, and they were putting themselves in these situations. And unbeknownst to them, because confidentiality in my field, that was my, also part of my story. I'm a survivor of sexual violence, I'm queer, I knew exactly what that messaging was doing to them internally, and so I got my call, as we talk about, to go to seminary because I wanted to be a voice on the other side of that, a voice of healing and wholeness, and why I focused my studies in womanist theology um, and got my certificate in sexuality and religion um, at the time, I was working at the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice um, as the Mary Jane Patterson Fellow. And while in seminary, I recognized that in none of my classes were they talking about reproductive issues. Were they talking about what did it look like to provide pastoral care to someone going through these decisions? And it made zero sense to me because as a pastor of a congregation, no matter what faith tradition you are, it's literally a part of the human experience. So how can you not be equipped to provide support and care to your congregants in that regard. Um, particularly within the black church context, the majority of congregants within the black church are black women. And so here you have pastors, majority of whom are men who have absolutely no idea how to support them through something that the majority of them will experience. And I don't just mean birth, I mean infertility, I mean sexual violence, I mean menopause, all of these things that don't get talked about and that get kind of swept under the rug because again, patriarchy took over and was leading the, the charge in how things were getting expressed. Uh, so before I left seminary, I actually created a curriculum called Reproductive Justice Informed Pastoral Care. Um, and from there, I was able to begin working as a chaplain. Um, I worked at an abortion clinic as a chaplain, and I also trained other chaplains in how to provide a non-judgmental ministry of presence to people facing the range of reproductive justice issues. Um, it's also at that time that I named myself as Reverend Pleasure, and it's because um, reading Kelly Brown Douglas's book, Sexuality and the Black Church, is where I learned of what uh, she refers to as Platonized religion, um, Platonized Christianity, um, so that from Plato um, and that that inception into uh, the church context, which we see in things like St. Augustine's Confessions um, and other texts, is where you start to get that separation and demonizing of black bodies and embodiment, um, and that you know the idea that black bodies could be used to be villainized because we refused to separate. And so as we started to preference puritanical values, the idea that this was the ideal you were supposed to live up to. And if you did not live, live into that ideal of being chaste, of being these things, of not fully feeling all of your feelings, for example, then you could be demonized, you can be punished physically, spiritually, in, in any way that they deemed fit. Thank you for that eloquent introduction. Um, wow, I, I love how you brought that all together. And, and I want to continue in this sort of structure where I'd love to ask each of you your, your sort of historical and traditional grounding of your work and then where your own role uh, comes into that. Katie, can we, can, we, can we do you next? Absolutely, thank you. It's so good to be here and, and to have space to talk about this intersection that you know, for those of us who do this work, we've been talking about for a long time, but finally have space like this to share the history of this work that is that is ancient. Um, you know, when I think about where we are now and I think about our shared traditions, one thing that really has been coming to me is the importance of holding the current moment, thinking about our past, and also the ancient practice of holding prophetic and theological imagination about where we want to go. Because I think in moments like this, there's so much suffering and crisis that has always been true that we can often get stuck in the paradigm of the now and not think about how do we respond to the crises right now in such a way that we are building toward the future that we actually want to exist in. And I think that that is, 
unique to people of faith that we hold that theological imagination. And it is an ancient practice. We see the prophets doing this, you know, being in the midst of so much suffering, but holding a vision of a different reality that they believe is imminent, not just a fantasy, but one that is actually within reach. And so I think that's really important in my own work to be thinking, what is it that I'm trying to build toward? Not just what am I opposed to? Because I think sometimes we end up reinforcing the very things that we say that we're against by only holding that which we are opposed to. So I just wanted to offer that as an initial framing. I'll start with my personal story just because Reverend Pleasure, there's some overlap here because when I was a seminary student, I had a very similar experience where issues of our reproductive and sexual lives were not part of the curriculum. And the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice came to campus and offered pastoral care trainings and how to accompany people. I thought, well, this sounds very practical. This is actually something that I could do and, and help people with. So I went. And then I thought, well, I need to use what I've learned because I don't want to just have learned in theory how to have these conversations. I want to practice this. So I contacted the um, abortion provider across the street from the seminary and said, could I come have a tour? They let me in. And what was so interesting was the day that I came, I, it should have occurred to me, but the day that I arrived for my tour, I was assumed to be, by the protesters, a person there to have an abortion. And it was a very impactful experience for me because I felt what it felt like to enter for the first time. I had not been to an abortion clinic before. What it felt like for the for the staff and the the doctors, but also for the patients. And I found myself recoiling and almost wanting to tell them that I wasn't there to have an abortion. And I had to really unpack that after. Why did I care? What did it matter to me why they thought I was there? And I realized that despite the fact that I was there to volunteer, I still had my own internalized abortion stigma that I had to work through. And that's an ongoing process. I think it's just part of the waters in which we we all swim, just like racism and sexism and heterosexism. There is an anti-abortion narrative that none of us can escape, having grown up in this culture. And so for me, that was the first part of the work, was really interrogating what judgments did I have about people who have abortions, and what do I want to replace that with? And the answer for me was compassion. So that was the first part. And then the second part was going within the clinic and experiencing the, the love and the, the sacredness of what was happening there. And that was such a profound experience for me because every narrative that I had heard was this is a godless place. And to actually experience the divine in the procedure room, I was pulled in one day because they were down a staff person. They said, Katie, can you please come? Because I was volunteering weekly. Can you come into the procedure room? and hold the patient's hands. And I, I didn't know how to say no. It was kind of a, if not me, then who? And I just held the patient's hands and it was this very sacred experience for me of just, I can't even describe it, but there was just something ineffable about it that just felt so divine. And I thought, wow, this is the ministry. This is the ministry happening within the walls of the clinic and the people who look like me and claim the same faith tradition are outside yelling at patients being hateful. I thought well, there's got to be a way to bridge these things. And so that's kind of the origin story. When I think about my call to ministry, it really was within the walls of the clinic, of the abortion clinic there. Um, and when I think about the work, that's really what brings me back is thinking about the people, you know, who I got to accompany through that experience and, and their willingness to allow me in was such a sacred moment for me. You know, when we talk about the history, there is an ancient history, like I alluded to, of people of faith have always resisted reproductive oppression. We see that in our sacred texts, if we go back. So this is nothing new. But when we talk specifically about pre roe because I think this history just has gotten erased so much by white Christian nationalists that there were clergy operating in 38 states, starting here in New York City, through the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion. And from 1967 to 1973, they helped about half a million people get access to abortion care. And that is part of our history that I think has been erased that we need to talk about. And we also need to interrogate because the clergy involved were white men. It's not that there weren't clergy of color or black clergy. That was a decision that they made to center whiteness in that, in that movement. And I think that that is something that we have to both interrogate and also honor the legacy of. And so now as we're, we're in this post row world, yes, we look to the legacy, but we also interrogate what, what is different now? What have we learned? How do we do it differently? 
in these times to make sure that people get access to the care that they need. So that's you know, something that we are mindful of at the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice is how do we do things differently now while we still honor our past. And again, I know we'll get into this, but really thinking about the ways that white Christian nationalism has created a narrative that has erased the pluralism within Christianity and also erased anyone who isn't a Christian from the dialogue. Yeah, I have to say I had a lot of fun um, digging into the archives of the clergy consultation service when I was working on a piece for New York Magazine, just kind of, uh, it was it was a, a piece anticipating the post-Roe universe at that point. And it's just, there's, I think one of them wrote a memoir about what it was like to be in these trainings. And they are a bunch of white guys being like, the uterus is what? Like, it's just, <laughs> but they did it. They really, they put themselves on the line um, as, as imperfect to, and incomplete of an effort as it was. I, I recommend it. It's And if you look at, um, Linda Greenhouse and uh, Riva Siegel's Before Roe, there's there's a, a section there that has uh, some primary sources from the Clergy Consultation Service. Mm -hmm. Andrea. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. I am not a member of the clergy, um, but I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, as a lay person representing National Council of Jewish Women New York, and I'm here to say abortion bans are against my religion. Um, in no uncertain terms, thank you. Um, I'm not a rabbi or a Torah scholar, but I don't need to be because Jewish texts and teaching are pretty clear on this. As you know, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, uh, we, you know, this this could be a 30-minute sermon if I were a rabbi, but it doesn't need to be. <laughs> so, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to give you the really brief overview. Um, under Jewish law, life does not begin at conception. The Talmud asserts that a fetus is near fluid until about 40 days, and following that, it's considered a part of the pregnant person's body, an important part, like an arm or a leg, a very important part, uh, but not a being with life and rights of its own. Um, and it's not viewed as its, its own independent human being and until birth. Uh, largely interpreted as when, when the head has emerged. And um, again, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll tell you a, a little Torah story. We'll do a mini, mini text study uh, led by a lay person. The Torah re recounts a story, two men are fighting and accidentally injure a pregnant woman who is standing nearby, resulting in a miscarriage. And the story explains that if the only injury is the miscarriage, then the perpetrator must pay a fine. But if the pregnant person, in this case a woman, is gravely injured, then it shall be an eye for an eye, life for a life, treated as a murder. And the, you know, the, the dominant interpretation of this among rabbis is that the fetus is not a person. Um, you know, various, as, as was said in the previous panel, and I think alluded to here, um, Jewish sources explicitly state that abortion is not only permitted, but is actually required in cases where the life or the health of the pregnant person is at stake. And what's more, that word health is interpreted usually to mean not just physical health, but also psychological and mental health. So simply put, um, in my religion, abortion is health care. Um, and should be treated as such, um, you know, with all the individual complexities that complex healthcare decisions have. Um, so I think we're starting to see this more now in the legal discourse and in legal challenges. You know, post Roe, we're starting to see those challenges to abortion bans on the grounds of religious freedom. I think it was stated very very insightfully in the previous panel that maybe we've been reluctant to do this before, uh, not wanting religious freedom to, to, for lack of a better word, trump other freedoms in our society. But I think, is it, again, at risk of a pun here, but is this like a Hail Mary kind of pass? Um, we're, we're, I think we're just going for it. Um, so there are several cases around the country now um, you know, no one religion, you know, abortion bans violate the First Amendment, they violate, violate uh, the establishment of, of religion clause. Um, there's a case in Missouri 
uh, right now that was just filed, I think, in January, where a group of religious leaders, you know, an interfaith group of religious leaders uh, are challenging the state's abortion ban, really citing the fact that the legislators in the state explicitly cited their own religious beliefs uh, as their motivation for this law. It's you know, in the record, in the discussion on, on their state legislative floor uh, in discussing this bill. Um, here in New York, um, I, well, I guess and I'll, I'll, I'll say a, a tiny bit about my own personal story. Um, you know, I started my career 30 years ago at Planned Parenthood Federation of America in the communications department. Um, it was a formative career experience for me coming out of college, but if you had told me 30 years ago where we would be today, um, well, I don't know that all of us could have kept getting out of bed in the morning um, to go to work, but, but, I, but I do want to start by saying that for me, you know, it's, it's leaders like my fellow panelists um, and our moderator that, that get me out of bed every morning, so thank you. Um, here in New York, at, at NCJW New York, we're choosing um, to really focus very heavily on the issue of fake abortion clinics here in New York State. Um, they're also known as crisis pregnancy centers. I see some people nodding. I'm guessing that there might be some people out there going, what? What are you talking about, fake clinics? Um, so bear with me a minute. I'm going to tell you what they are and what they do. Um, fake clinics are the front lines of the anti-abortion movement, both here in New York State and across the country. This is an issue in every state, including ours. Most people don't even know they exist, and that's why they're so effective. There are well over 100 fake clinics here in New York State. There's two dozen right here in New York City. They operate under the radar. Their one and only goal is to keep people from accessing abortion, and they're very good at it. Um, and, I, and I bring it up here today, and, and we're focusing on it um, at NCJW because these fake clinics are most often run by well-funded national networks of religious organizations, mostly evangelical Christians. They use their religious convictions to justify lies and manipulation of people who may be at the most vulnerable moment in their lives. And that's why we think it's so important for people of faith to speak out, to call them out on what it is they're doing, and to take away their power by educating all New Yorkers about these places. Um, you know, we believe that religion and God does not justify uh, and does not sanction lying and manipulation. So I could talk more about what these places do and where they are. We can get into that later. Yes. Thank you so much to the three of you for, for situating that so beautifully. I think we have a really great base now for a discussion. Um, so I, I, we've now taken this long arc. Let's go back to just last June or to last May. Um, Dobbs. It's in the title of our panel. Um, as precarious as abortion access was for many people before, we can see that it can get dramatically worse. We've seen abortion bans in place in about a third of the country. We've seen horrific stories of individuals denied care whether they were seeking an abortion or not. Um, we have people f uh, forced to resort to means, uh, grassroots means, um, that might not be their first choice for care. Um, we're facing uh, increased criminalization. There were people being criminalized before for ending their pregnancies, but it has dramatically stepped up. And I'm just wondering, um, I, I wanna start with the clergy members here and the, the direct pastoral folks here. Um, how has your work changed in the light of this completely overwhelming onslaught attack, um, particularly uh, if any of you are dealing with patients and counseling them, but also, you know, we could talk just across the board about what it means to even keep up strategically, legislatively, politically with all of this. Um, simply put, how has life changed for you in where the people that you work with after Dobbs? 
Uh, so I'm currently the co-executive director of an organization called SACRED, uh, Spiritual Alliance of Communities for Reproductive Dignity. Um, and part of our work is uh, has grown out of the Texas Freedom Network, um, and it's grounded in congregational designation. Um, and so it's uh, loosely modeled after uh, what a lot of churches did around LGBTQ rights with uh, creating affirming ministries. Uh, and so part of why we are focused on that is because of the lack of education that we're recognizing a lot of congregations have around around things like religious freedom and religious liberty and the, mis the, the misconstruction of religious freedom and religious liberty. So with the uh, congregational designation, what we're working to do is to educate folks around reproductive justice, where it comes from, what is its definitions, and also around how it is that they can be co-conspirators, not allies, um, with their congregants, with pregnant people, with women, um, around what it is that they need to access. And so we have a curriculum and a training, um, and a train the trainers uh, that we go into different churches and do. We've done it virtually and in person. Um, and really, that is becoming a way to galvanize more and more faith voices, um, because so many folks I, I see are afraid are afraid of saying the wrong thing, of doing the wrong thing. One of the things that white Christian nationalists have been really great at is to put forward this idea of this one interpretation of Christianity, this one interpretation of the Bible, this one interpretation of God. But like Katie mentioned, what you actually have is the fear-based, limited prophetic imagination of cisgender white heterosexual men. Their prophetic imagination is this tiny. This is what they have created with their prophetic imagination, is a world in which they are so afraid of losing power that the only thing that they can do is subjugate other people. Our prophetic imagination has always been wider than that, has always been bigger than that. And so by going the route of education, of galvanizing, of helping people to be less afraid, and to helping people to unlearn the shame that they have been so good at perpetuating, then we're base building. We are really rooting in our own moral and prophetic imagination, right? So this idea as well that um, there is one type of morality uh, of who gets grace, of who gets moral, moral understanding and moral preferencing. So I don't know if any of you have seen, but recently, Jessa Duggar, uh, who is a part of the Duggar family, um, very, very much so a part of the white national Christian uh, crew, um, had to have an abortion. And there is a debate going on right now um, about whether or not she actually had an abortion. Right. She had a miscarriage. Her miscarriage was incomplete. The medical terminology for miscarriage is spontaneous abortion. When a body does not expel a pregnancy completely, you have to undergo a procedure known as a DNC, dilation and curation, in order to complete the abortion that the body started. And so conservatives are trying to say that what happened is, is that no, she had a procedure to complete her miscarriage. Yes, she had an abortion, right? right? But she is being she is being privileged and given this higher morality, this higher ground, because again, it's very effective to say abortion is murder, because nobody wants to be a murderer, right? That is the morality heartstring that the that the movement has been able to pull on for so long. And so now their own language is coming to bite them in the butts because she did have an abortion. And it's sad, and I'm sorry for her that she had to go through that and that she had a miscarriage of a wanted pregnancy. But at the end of the day, this is why everyone needs access to the same things, not just a few people. And so I think part of also our work is this political education, okay. is helping people to understand things like these, that what the opposition has been so good at is getting people tripped up on language mm. and what? getting them tripped up on theological pe uh, understandings and underpinnings because they say that they are the authority on them. Well, and I, I think a lot of people are getting an education in the 
uh, sort of fuzziness of these lines because you have people who are having miscarriages who can't get care mm -hmm. in many of these states right. because it is believed to be running afoul of the law. And anytime somebody in the anti-abortion side is confronted with this, they just say, well, that's not an abortion. Yes, that's right? correct. And even the 10-year-old the, the rape victim in Ohio, that's not an abortion either, even though there wasn't even a miscarriage in that that's context. Correct. And so there is this effort to say, this is the good woman, these are the bad women. Exactly. Um, and in the practice of medicine and in people's lives, these lines are just not so dark and clear. That's right. Before the decision came down, I had just published my second book called A Complicated Choice where I went into some of these stories of every single abortion, every single pregnancy is different and unique. There is no way to legislate this because it's about the context of an individual person's life in the midst of systemic oppression also. And I think, the way that abortion has been talked about specifically is so abstract. And it's in these very binary ways of either it was you know, the best thing I ever did, I never thought about it again, or it was the worst thing that I ever did, and there's no room for the real human experiences that people have. Um, and so that's why I, the call is to compassion, to not to suspend your own judgment about what you think you would do in a situation you have not been in and give space for the person's actual experience to come to the center and say, what is it that you, how can I be of help to you? How can I accompany you through this? And that is, that's the call that I've been talking about for a long time is it's not about understanding somebody else's experience. It is about creating space for people's actual lived realities to take, to take center stage instead of your ideology. Um, that's very abstract. Has it become harder or easier since the Supreme Court did what it did to make that point clear to people? Are more people open to it? I think so. And, you know, none of us who work in this space were surprised. I think we were surprised by the timing of the leaked draft, but this is a 50-year project that the anti-abortion movement has successfully done. From the very beginning, access to reproductive health care, including abortion, has been chipped away. Uh, any of us who've been working in this space saw the writing on the wall. I think a lot of people were in a state of disbelief that this could actually happen, but those of us working in the space were not surprised and have been preparing for this moment for a very long time. And so I think the the opportunity of a moment like this is the increased attention, questioning how did we get here, more people willing to put aside their fear and actually say, I want to be speaking about this, I want to be engaged. And also that requires the education because oftentimes we'll have people say, hey, I've got the great idea on how to solve this problem. It's like, wait a second, there have been people doing this work for a long time. Let us help you understand how we got here do your own internal work around why you have that internalized abortion stigma I was talking about before you start to get engaged. Because if we don't challenge our own internal stigma, assumptions, then when we go out and do work with people whose stories are gonna bump up against our, our values, we end up replicating harm. And so I think that that's a huge part of the work right now is to do the internal work within yourself, within the community, which is why the work that Sacred is doing is so important. You know, what are our shared values around this? Do we want to change them in response to where we are now? And then from that place, respond, rather than starting from a place of reactivity. Yeah. Can I? Um, we live in a, you work in a city and state uh, that held itself out as a refuge for folks living in more hostile jurisdictions. I wonder what the, the post-Dobbs world has looked like for you. Yeah, I think it's affected our work um, at NCJW New York in a couple of ways. Um, I do wanna, wanna really highlight what we've been talking about. I think there is real opportunity for learning right now as this post-Dobbs world forces into the public discourse um, a real consideration of the, the, the totality of experience um, that people face around pregnancy, miscarriage, birth, pregnancy loss, mm -hmm. um, abortion, um, stillbirth, you name it. I think that uh, you know, we, we also at NCJW New York have, for about 30 years have run a peer support program called the Pregnancy Loss Support Program. We know these stories very well of all of the experience um, of pregnancy loss at every stage 
of pregnancy, and there's also a huge stigma around that issue. It's not discussed, it's not talked about. People feel very alone, although they're anything. But if you know the statistics of pregnancy loss and, and realizing the intersection of these issues, realizing the, the complexity of the choices and medical situations that people deal with that I think these legislators, uh, you know, on the floor in the state legislators just have no clue um, that these situations even existed. And so it's infuriating and outrageous, but it's also an opportunity for learning um, for many people. I think there are many people who just didn't know about you know, the type of issue that Jessa Duggar is facing and that, you know, that these are not black and white lines. So I think there's a real opportunity for learning and, and we've tried to be part of that dialogue. The other thing that, that we're seeing, um, you know, as soon as the decision was, was leaked was the Jewish community in New York really wanting to stand up and show up and speak out as Jews um, for reproductive rights and abortion access. Um, in a in a in a very overwhelming way, <laughs> and um, you know we're in a position at NCJW to harness that and to to give those voices a place to speak. And we're really we're hearing from rabbis, we're hearing from congregations in a in a in a really renewed way that we haven't before. So I you know I think there's an opportunity there, and there's a real challenge for New York to remain. Um, a safe haven and a beacon and a leader. Um, you know, in abortion access, there is more that we can be doing. Um, you know, there are some other policies that are in the works, you know, a shield law for doctors who uh, want to provide abortion, you know, medication abortion via telehealth for people in other states. There's more we can be doing, so there are policies you know, coming down the pike in our state legislature. And there's more we need to be doing, again, on this fake clinics issue. You know, the, the leaders of that movement have made it very clear, they, make no, they don't hide their agenda, that their goal is to open more and more and more fake clinics to create more chaos and confusion for the flood of people coming here from other states. And so, you know, those are those are the fronts that we're working on. Yeah. Um, can I just add something? Um, as Andrea's talking particularly about these fake clinics, um, wanted to want to connect some dots, right? So we're talking about um, the intersections and Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, coined intersectionality in the 1980s for a reason, and it plays out here very well. So when you're talking about, we have tons of fake clinics where I live in Georgia, uh, I live in Atlanta, and we also have a similar campaign um, to expose them. But when we're talking about why they're so problematic, because they're so good at advertising themselves, for example, as crisis pregnancy centers, right. right? As a place where you come when you're in crisis, when you're pregnant and you don't know what to do. So who are they targeting? They're targeting poor people. Mm -hmm. They're targeting targeting black and brown folks. They're targeting, targeting people who already had issues accessing the healthcare they needed even before Dobbs. And that's part of why they are so effective because one of the projects of colonialism is to make us forget. Right? to forget our history, to forget that, oh, yes, we had religious people who were in support of us, not just religious people who are going to pretend that they are in support of us. And so when I go into this clinic and I think that I'm gonna get care, I'm gonna get diapers, I'm going to get support throughout my pregnancy and all of these things, and actually what ends up happening is that they lie to people about how far along they are. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason, part of why they're so dangerous is because they're not regulated. They're actually giving people false medical information. They don't have to tell them the truth. So you go in and they'll tell you, for example, if you're in Georgia, oh, you're eight weeks along. Because they know Georgia has a six-week abortion ban. But actually, you're five weeks along. 
And so they'll tell you that you're eight weeks along so that you think you have no other choice, you have no other options. And then you don't know how to get access to leave the state. And then there's fear mongering. And then they make you think you're going to get criminalized. And if you're a rape survivor, you actually have to go and file a police report in order to get uh, a sign off to bring to your doctor to get one of the exceptions that they talked about exists. They're not really exceptions. We already know about what happens when most black and brown people go to the police. So they're not gonna go to the police. So when we're talking about the intersections of these issues and why I'm always going to talk about this from a reproductive justice framework is because it's not just about abortion. Mm -hmm. It's about what is what are the barriers to care? What are the barriers to people being able to live in the fullness of who they are, to live into their wholeness, to be seen um, as individuals worthy of dignity and respect, and to not be criminalized and villainized because they have to make difficult decisions for their bodies. Well, I, I wonder if I could um, underline your point and tell me if I'm misrepresenting it, but I think what you're saying is that there has also been a vacuum created by lack of access to care, but also by a kind of outreach, right? Whatever someone's pregnancy decision is, you know, that the, the crisis pregnancy centers are, they're putting up these ads that, and you know, of course they're the same organizations that are putting up the ads saying that the most dangerous place for a black child is in the womb. Um, I think they're still at that, I assume, but they've been doing that for a very long time. Um, it kind of reminds me of for-profit colleges, right? Like they, they're so good at advertising, they're so good at being there. And you know what, it's pretty hard to get an appointment if you want prenatal care, if you want an ultrasound. Right. You know, I just interviewed a woman who answers all the questions on Reddit about abortion. You know, a lot of people end up going to crisis pregnancy centers because they can't afford an ultrasound even if they know that it's fake. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but maybe folks right. in the audience know. You know, and, and I was, I'm thinking a lot about this. I was pregnant during, um, Dobbs coming down, and um, and this is some you know if we're talking about the intersections, our city that we're sitting in right now, um, a black woman is eight times more likely to die in childbirth here. Right. You know, so at the same time that we and the rest of the country is also bad, but we have a ton of resources and we have progressive legislators, um, and so I, I do I really want to, I guess appreciate even more what you are doing because I think that the reason that these fake clinics are able to survive, one, they get tons of money from right-wing donors, they are, it's pretty cheap if you don't do real medical care, right? Real medical care is very expensive in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they're also very good at marketing themselves. And, you know, further on what you've been talking about, they, when New York tries to regulate them, they make all kinds of arguments, including religious freedom arguments. Right, yes. yes. They say, I don't That's have to be regulated like a medical clinic because this is my religious or my First Amendment speech uh, exercise. And yeah. so it's very That's insidious what, in yeah. that way. That's what's happening right now. And, and, and yes, to, to validate exactly what you're saying, they, they offer free pregnancy tests and free sonograms. They lure people in with free services. Maybe, maybe people need free pregnancy tests and free sonograms. Right. No strings attached. From our legitimate <laughs> medical yeah. uh, exactly. system. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and I, think, I think that would really help. Um, but, but yes, the religious freedom argument is used as a, as a club to beat back uh, just very common sense regulation or even information gathering. Um, there, there is a bill that was passed, I think, in June in New York State to just study these places. They call them in the bill limited service pregnancy centers. So they're, you know, it, folks that put themselves out as pregnancy centers but do not provide the full complement of reproductive health services or even referrals for the full complement of reproductive health services. So that's how they define them. It's very narrowly defined. It's a religion-free definition. Um, but this, it's a, it's a study to gather information about, you know, who's going to these places, what services are they seeking, what are their outcomes. Um, it's an attempt to just gather some information. And it's being challenged on religious freedom grounds by, by one of these places that is not typical, um, by one of these places that, that, that is saying they fall under this definition. It's a, it's a center run by nuns in a church. 
Um, this is not the kind of place that this bill or, or, or that, that we at NCJW are concerned about. And I, I do want to make one thing clear when it comes to crisis pregnancy centers. They do have a right to exist. Um, if you are nuns in a church and you want to welcome people into your church and tell them what you believe about life and birth and abortion, that needs to be, we need to have space for that in this country. We're, we're strong believers in every part of the First Amendment. Um, but, it, but they shouldn't be allowed to lie and they shouldn't be allowed to misrepresent themselves. My guess is that the nuns operating out of the Catholic Church really don't, don't fit my definition of a fake clinic. Um, and so it's, I'm sure it's no accident that those are the plaintiffs that were chosen in this challenge. Right. And, but it would be hard to mistake a nun for a doctor necessarily. Yeah. It, it, I mean, well, I, I'm just could you be, I don't, I don't know if they a nun, pick, I think, I believe a nun could be a doctor, yeah. I think. Uh, no, I'm not saying that to stereotype but, them. <laughs> I'm just saying that they would pick an example in which deception potentially would be harder to prove. Exactly. They, you know, these are lawsuits that are designed to win. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, you look like you wanted to jump in. I, we've, I, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I, I, I just I want to ask, um, we've, we've said this phrase, white Christian nationalism, a few times. And I'm just wondering if um, our panelists could talk, tell me a little bit about, I'm sure that people have said to you, you know, it sounds really great what you're saying, but that's not really religion. Right? That's not really what Christianity says, or like, okay, Jews say that, but there's not that many of them in the U.S., or, you know, this is I what my religion is. true. Uh, I mean, t technically, 50% yeah, of the stage, but, um, but, <laughs> but. Um, We're overrepresented yeah, here on the sorry, Upper West Side. Sorry, yeah. um, but I, I guess I'm wondering, um, I would be so interested in your best argument in response or best conversation, maybe argument is, is too adversarial for what I'm thinking about, to someone who is genuinely puzzled um, about why it is that the white Christian nationalist argument about reproduction is not the definitive one. And you, you've made an affirmative argument for where you're coming from, but to somebody who's really trying to say, you know, why isn't that religion? All religion is terrible, or I was raised in this one. Um, I, I'd love to hear you, Leticia, because you're nodding like you understand my question. I hope it makes sense. I hope I do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm still, I think I was still noodling on it. Um, okay. So uh, Reverend Jackie earlier talked about the fact that she was preaching about Hagar and Sarah today. I've actually recently been writing about Hagar and Sarah, um, and I've been writing about it from the perspective of survivors of sexual violence. And Hagar is a woman of color who is the only woman who ever gets to name God. Naming in any religion is a very big deal, right? God gave Adam the right to name the animals, um, you have in other faiths where the naming, the perceiving of a deity is, is, is just not heard of. So anyone who gets the opportunity, the right to name God is a big deal. And the person who gets to name, the woman who gets to name God is Hagar. She is a slave. She is a handmaid. If anyone if anyone watches The Handmaid's Tale or has ever read The Handmaid's Tale, Hagar is the original handmaid. She is given to her husband, given to Sarah's husband, to, for the sole purpose of bearing a child. So in womanist theology, um, and Dr. Will Gaffney um, does a midrash, a beautiful midrash on this, um, in womanist theology, uh, she talks about the linkage between Hagar and between uh, enslaved African women who were made to be the wet nurses of white women who were uh, raped and who gave birth and whose children were taken from them repeatedly. The justification of those things is rooted in white Christian nationalism. The idea that some people need to be 
relegated to that level in order for others, chosen ones, to be elevated is justifiable in white Christian nationalism. The idea that, uh, actually when I was in seminary, I had a, a classmate uh, who I would identify as a white Christian nationalist tell me, in our entire New Testament class actually, that I as a black woman should be grateful for slavery because that was the way that I came to know Jesus. <laughs> exactly, which Jesus, right? Because Jesus was a Jew, a brown man. <laughs> Jesus was a person who flipped tables. And this idea that I should be grateful for the enslavement of my ancestors because otherwise I would not know your version of Jesus. So I don't know that having this conversation would not be argumentative, right? That was the part it I was like. It could be, it just doesn't have, no, it could be. <laughs> I just didn't want to define how you would have it. But, leaving it open. But it's where I would begin, yeah. right? Because this idea that, one, you don't even want to admit that Jesus isn't white. Yeah. And so I'm sorry, but I can't, I, we're not starting on the same level there, right? If, we're, if that's where the conversation is beginning. Um, the other thing is that this conflation, especially in the United States, of Christianity and nationalism, right? God's country, God's America, God bless America and nowhere else. All of these types of sentiments, again, leaves out the, the majority. It leaves out the idea that as, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna speak as a black woman in America, the idea that as black people, we are essentially, as my colleague Jaleesa Jackson talks about, operating as a colonial project within our own country. Because our culture is constantly trying to be eradicated and robbed. And so when we're looking at Christianity and the pluralism of Christianity, Christianity existed before the westernized version of Christianity, right? Christianity, when you look at the Coptic church, when you look at Ethiopia, when you look at the Orthodox church, they don't come to the same conclusions that westernized Christianity has come to. That is a particular project. That is a particular way of being and talking about Jesus. And this idea, the, and why I talked about earlier, the idea of remembering, why it is so important, because when black people remember and get to remember continuously that Jesus was a brown man who probably had like a little curly fro and <laughs> who, who talked constantly about liberation and freedom and who apologized to a woman who he called a dog when she called him out on it, right? That's the Jesus that I'm talking about. And so you have to be able to be in that type of a level of conversation when we're also ha talking about reproductive justice and when we're talking about um, access to healthcare and the, all of the intersectionalities of things um, that go into this conversation. And th thank you, that, that is what I was trying to get at and I appreciate you <laughs> answering more clearly than I asked it. I think I wanna ask it another way, just listening to you, which is just why stay within a faith tradition when the majority of it is so hostile to the values that you described, Katie? I love this question. It's one I get often. And I, I completely respect people for whom their religious experience has been so harmful to their own identity that they don't stay. And it is a question that I ask myself regularly. Why, you know, why do I hold on? Um, it's in part because I'm pissed. I, I don't want to let go of a tradition for so many people that has been liberatory, right? It's, it's holding space for both. Christianity has been the religion of empire and it's also been the religion of liberation. And it's both of those things. And staying within it allows for me to critique that tradition of empire, but also to reclaim and to hold up the parts of it 
that have been the sources of people's liberation. So I can't do that from without. And I think what you were asking, you know, people go, oh, well, that's not religion. It's kind of like when people say, oh, well, that's not an abortion. Like, no, this is religion. This is how some people live it out. And also, there are other ways to live into this, right? And within, we can critique those who weaponize a religion of liberation and use it to oppress others and say, wait a second, that's out of alignment with the values of this tradition that I also hold. So I'm very careful not to distance myself from Christians who weaponize the teachings for power over because we are all, we are all in the same identity. I don't say that they're not like me because we do share some things. I grew up in a very conservative evangelical church. I understand the binary thinking that goes beyond even just these conversations, right? So it's like, Within the knowing, I can actually have compassion for folks who have grown up in a tradition that tells them it is this or that, and hope that that there are spaces for people to journey to a new place. I'm not in control of anybody else's journey, but I can provide space for people to see there's actually a different way to live into your identity as a person of faith that can be liberatory, that doesn't have to be oppressive. Thank you for that. And and I was being sort of facetious before, but I, I do want to say, of course, that even within, you know, the, the Jewish text interpretation that you offered, even within the Jewish tradition, there are obviously more conservative, more patriarchal elements. Um, some of them are, in gov lots of them are in government in Israel. Some of them are here in New York City. Um, so I'm, you know, the, it is certainly a part of the Jewish tradition to say, like, you are not a legitimate Jew for, and let's just narrow it down to the status of women the status of LGBTQ individuals. So I guess it feels like it's time. I don't know, actually, it is time, okay. Um, I'm like, I should have come up here with a timekeeper. I could talk to you guys forever, but um, but in closing, you know, how, how do you um, deal with that question of sort of legitimacy or, or who gets to define um, what the religious authority is and, and when it comes to specifically these issues of who has the power to decide? Well, I'll just say that, you know, similar to other religious traditions, I mean, yeah, there is, there is you know, a continuum and there's variety within the Jewish community, especially here in New York City um, and New York State. Um, you know, there, there are different points of view on abortion, on health care, on education. Um, and we, you know, we work to be in community with other Jewish leaders um, when it comes to, you know, our Jews for Repro New York and Rabbis for Repro, which is an NCJW. You know, we do have um, a Jewish clergy from, you know, all across the, you know, Reform, Reconstructionist, Conservative, and Orthodox. But there is still a very, you know, wide continuum. Um, and, you know, who gets to say? It's the same question that I think we're all struggling with and that my co-panelists um, really elucidated, you know, so well. You know, who gets to say? I mean, that's, that's the question. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer, so I'll leave it as a question. Um, who gets to say, but we're, we're up here saying it. <laughs> yes, and I get to say I'm so privileged to have shared a stage with you all. Thank you so much for your teaching and your work.